I'm Carrie Garcia. I am so excited to be here. I, like I said, I, I do get to travel and speak a lot, but coming here um, is something special for me because this, these, these walls and this place has um, deep meaning for where I am today in my life. And I will share with you a little bit more about that, but I just want you to know that it is truly an honor to be here today and to share a little bit about uh, what God is doing. You know, I think when you walk in those doors, you should expect that God is gonna speak to you. Now, I don't know if you've come here and maybe you don't even know Jesus and that is all good. You belong here. You don't gotta believe to belong here. You just belong. You just come on in and I'm proud of you for coming and checking it out. It's a good thing to do. You don't have to believe what I believe. But I want you to know that if you want to hear from God, I promise you, he's trying to speak to you every day. Every day. So you didn't come through those doors just because you're trying to check a box or maybe you did because you're trying to check a box and that's okay. But God's going to speak to you today, and he's going to use me to do it. And that always trips me out. So we're in good company. Because I'm like, you realize who you picked to come on this day, right? And he's like, I know, just go. <laughs> it's all right. You'll make them feel better about themselves. I'm like, all right, all right, I got that. <laughs> so I am excited, and I'm glad that God is going to meet us here today. I was praying. I was praying for you guys. I really mean it. I literally pray everywhere before I go. Some people just say that I actually do it. And I prayed, God, what do you want to share with them? What do you want to talk with them about? And then I, then I had to go walk my dog. And that, you know, because we got a dog, you guys. I have three kids, which feels like six. I have a husband, which feels like two. And I have, um, actually, he would say that about me. He's like, oh, well, it feels like being married to four. So, touche, honey. Uh, I also run an organization and travel. And I was like, this would be a really good time to get a dog. Because dogs, they, they're just going to love you and they require no work. Yeah, that's Bosley. He's not that cute, actually. That was one of the better pictures. And I love all the dog people in here like, oh my gosh, she's sharing about her dog. And then there's the other people that are like me that are like, seriously, she's going to talk about her dog? She's that lady? I'm not that lady. I don't really like my dog very much. I found that dogs do things, they require a lot of work. They lick a lot of things that are inappropriate in front of guests. I'm like, I'm sorry, my dog's, I don't, he's bathing right now in our living room. I don't know what's happening. And then I have to go and take him on a walk. And when I go and walk Bosley, you know, I'm in my moments, I'm praying, I'm whatever, I go to walk Bosley. And then Bosley has to stop because Bosley got to do some things in the front of everybody. <laughs> what I have found is Bosley is just as embarrassed as I am for him. Look at his face. He's so embarrassed. I'm like, I'm sorry, people walk by and I'll just keep moving. I know, he's, he's pooping in the street. It's just a thing. I was thinking about Bosley. Oh, Bosley's gone. It's just me. I was thinking about Bosley and then I started praying about you guys. Isn't that funny? It's like, my dog's pooping. God, what do you want to share with Eastlake? And I started thinking about these buzzwords that we throw out, the, the words like real and authentic. I'm just trying to be real. Yes, okay. I feel like it's really aggressive. I, I'm just trying to be authentic. I'm trying to be my authentic self. Okay, you power, pump it out. I started thinking about those words, though, and I started thinking about, I can control how real I am. I can control how authentic I am. But then I started thinking about, well, can you really fully see me if I'm actually somewhat in control of what you see? Am I actually being fully real? Am I actually being fully authentic? Not really. Not really being real. I started thinking about the word exposed. I thought about that because I watched my dog poop on the streets, and I was like, you are exposed. Ain't nobody trying to poop on the street unless you had too many drinks, <laughs> and then we need more than church. <laughs> and, I was like, and I was thinking, and then, and then God speaks to me. See, God will speak any time. Even when your dog's pooping on the streets, he'll speak. Just listen. I started thinking about this word exposed, and I started thinking about if we really want to be free in our life, are we allowed to have control and cover up and only let you know what we want you to know? Is there real freedom in that? I'm not, no, I, I don't know if there is. There's a passage in the Bible, you'll see it in your outline there, in John chapter 8, 1 through 12, we're going to go through it. You can, you can kind of read it, but I'm just going to tell you from my mind. You see, this story, as I started to read about it, and they said, she speaks truth. Who do you want to share? What woman do you want to share about? You know, there's Mary. She like the best woman. And then there's Ruth. Ruth, she's at weddings. Ruth is a good one. God didn't want me to share about Ruth. Then I started reading, oh, yeah, Martha. She's good because she's a little bitter, and I get Martha. 
But then God was like, no, I want you to talk about this woman, the woman caught in adultery. I was like, oh, we going there, huh, Jesus? He's like, we going there. I'm like, okay, giddy up. Here we go. <laughs> See, here's the story. Jesus goes into the temple and he starts talking to people, just sharing with him about himself, which is cool. Just talking about who he is. And there's this sect of people called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they hate Jesus because Jesus has now come and started to even the playing field. And Pharisees, and if you don't know what a Pharisee is, they're just religious people that try to tell everybody what to do and think they're God. Ever met anybody? Yeah. If you're like, no, I've never met anyone like that, I'm like, well, then you're probably it. (laughs) They're just jerks. Always trying to take out Jesus because they want to be above and they want other people to be below and Jesus makes everyone equal. They don't like him. They don't like Jesus' plan so they are bent on taking him out. They got an idea. We know of this woman you see. She has been living in secret and having an affair with this man. We will catch him. We will get him. We will stumble him. So they go into this house and take this woman who is in the very act, it says, of adultery and drags her out of the house through the streets to the temple to see Jesus. And I had to stop when I'm reading this because my heart breaks for her because I think, what was she even wearing, this poor woman? I don't know what they had back in. Maybe they fashioned some hay and put it around her. I don't really know. But I'm imagining she wasn't dressed in her appropriate wear. Drugged through the streets in all of her humiliation to stand before Jesus. And here they are, the religious. They pick up stones and they look at Jesus and they say, according to the law, this woman needs to be put to death. What are you going to do, Jesus? We have every right to stone her. And they pick up stones, stones. To throw at a woman exposed and naked before all the crowds and Jesus. And I think about what she was thinking. Here's friends that she grew up with. Friends of her husband, friends of her lover. Women that have heard stories about her and now it's exposed. Everyone sees what they've been talking about. And they are ready to stone her. Jesus, who is like the coolest cat ever, Because you know if they came to me and said that, I'd be like, you guys better back off. I know how you were looking at Sally the other day and Pharisee you. I would have gone crazy. And they're like, that's why God's like, Carrie, that's why you're not me. (laughs) Oh, yes, I got to remember that. (laughs) But Jesus does none of that. You would think Jesus would defend with anger and outrage. But wouldn't that have created more of a scuffle? Wouldn't that have drawn more attention and said he's quiet? And he bends down and he starts writing on the sand. Well, this enrages the Pharisees. They're angry. They want an answer. And they start yelling out, what are you going to do, Jesus? Come on now. You talk about kindness and love, but here's the law. Are you going to obey it? He stands up and he looks at them. And he says, okay, go ahead, stoner. But who's ever without sin, you be the first to cast the stone. He bends back down and he starts writing in the sand. And we don't know what he writes in the sand. I wish I knew what he wrote. But it must have been so powerful that whatever he wrote in the sand caused these men who were ready to murder another human being to one by one stop dropping, start dropping their stones. And then they're gone. It's just her and Jesus. There she is. I can't imagine that she's looking even him in the eye. You ever been in a place where you have been so humiliated? You've been so wounded and so hurt that you can't even look in the eyes of someone. You just look down. Jesus being Jesus, I would imagine, lifted her face up, looked her in the eyes and said, where are your accusers? Haven't they condemned you? In all of this transaction, she can plead nothing. She can't say, but Lord, Lord, let me explain what happened. This is what, you know what, hey, I'm really sorry. You don't know what happened in my past. She says nothing. She has nothing to give. She says three words. Where are your accusers? Haven't they condemned you? No, my Lord. No, my Lord. They're gone. 
And he just speaks back to her, I don't condemn you either. And then he gives her a charge, a choice, go and sin no more. You see, now this woman has encountered the presence of God. I'm not so different than the woman in this story. And I would venture to say that you aren't either. You see, maybe adultery is not your thing. Maybe that's not where you're hung up, but maybe it's in addiction, or maybe it is in success, or maybe you're striving so hard to be perceived that everything is good on the outside when you are dying on the inside. Because at the bottom line, it's not addiction or sex or lover's arms or marriage that's going to be good or our kids keeping right or climbing the corporate ladder that's going to fill us. It's truly connection and a relationship with this man, this God-man, Jesus Christ. You're craving it, whether you know it or not. It's the very thing that will actually bring freedom. I know this story because on the outside growing up, pastor's kid, all looked good. On the inside, our house was in secrets and shambles. As my mom suffered with an eating disorder my whole life and mental illness, we never talk about that. And that plays out in my heart and in my life because I just so desperately want to be seen in my home. If I can't be seen there, then I will be seen outside in the world and I step into drugs and addiction becomes my story. And a full-blown meth addict by the time I'm 19 years old. Living under a bridge. This is life. I give that up. I'm going to go straight in. You know what? We're going to get rid of that. Let's just go into ministry because healthy people go into ministry. And I dive into ministry and I get married and we just plug at the, at the machine and perform and perform and perform. But when the lights are out and nobody's around, my heart is breaking. If people knew what I was really like on the inside, they wouldn't want to be around me. You see, I knew how to perform. I didn't know how to be authentic or real and I surely didn't want to be exposed. Everything comes to a head. You can't live like that for very long. And at 27 years old, I just thought, I can't do this. You see, those lies play in your head. What will people think of me if they knew who I really was? Oh, we've seen. They have stones. There's four people in this, in this uh, passage. We see Jesus. Ain't none of you Jesus. I know some of you want to be Jesus. I want to release you from that because Jesus died on a cross. So you ready? You're not Jesus. But he's there. He's present. We see that there's the woman, this woman who is exposed before Jesus. We see that there's these Pharisees standing there with stones in their hand. I thought about those Pharisees. I want to hate those Pharisees. But Jesus speaks to my heart. He says, I love those Pharisees. You see, they're not holding stones because they really want to take her out. They're holding stones because it's so much easier to deflect what other people are doing than actually deal with what's going on on the inside. It's so much easier to go, Jesus, what are you going to do about them? How come they're living like that, Jesus? What are you going to do? Want me to take care of it? I'll get a stone. And it's so much easier to carry a stone and blame somebody else and deflect from what's really going on on the inside, but Jesus says, I wanna release you from these stones. You know what's even crazier? Is some of you deserve to have those stones because what has been done to you in your past has been so wrong and so violating that you have a right to carry that stone and take that person out because they crossed lines they should have never crossed. So you hold stones with righteousness and justice and yet God is saying, the stones are killing you. It's too much of a weight to carry. Drop your stone. I think about the, the, the fourth person in this story, and, and those are the bystanders standing there in the temple, watching all of this go down. I can't help but think about those bystanders that are there, watching as Jesus is standing with this woman. What is he going to do? 
knowing her life and knowing her story, seeing the Pharisees, some of them in their hearts, I'm sure, are enraged. Why would they do this? But they're too scared to say anything. They also think, gosh, if they ever catch me, I'm going to be like her. What's Jesus going to do? They just stand in the corner. You see, bystanders are a lot of us. Because somehow, somewhere along the way, the enemy has told you that this story is for everyone else, it's not for you. In fact, he has so lied to you that he has pushed you into that corner. Stay hidden in your secrets, in isolation, and don't come out. So you stand there, watching as life goes by, thinking how great this story is for everyone else. And yet, not ever feeling like you are welcomed into it. I told you about my, my mom. She struggled with mental illness and hurts, eating disorders that were robbing her, trying to stay perfect on the outside but broken on the inside. You know, when you believe lies for a really long time, and if you don't get anything from my message, I want you to hear this. When you believe lies for a really long time, they become your truth. And there is a truth that wants to shatter those lies, and he wants to do it today. But my mom believed those lies for a really long time, and at 50 years old, desperate and alone, and had left everybody that loved her, she found herself in an apartment, and those lies took its toll. She thought, it would be better if I wasn't here. I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad Christian. I'm a bad ex-wife. I'm a bad follower of Jesus. I should not be here. And it took her life, worst day of my life. God's redemptive love comes into my life because he knew I needed a mama. Many years ago, there was a woman that walked through these doors. Her name is Kimberly. Her marriage had been destroyed. Her name had been tarnished. She was abandoned and left with five little kids. She came into the doors of this place desperate and exposed. Will she find love? She didn't find it in this building. She found it in the presence of Holy Spirit that indwells this building. And over the course of years, her heart started to grow and feel love again, and she met my dad, and they got married, and she took me in. You see, God doesn't want you to bring all of your stuff. For so many of us, we check these boxes like, let me go to church, check a box. Let me strive to get better in the corporate America, check a box. Let me be skinnier or prettier or a better mom or a better friend or a better wife, and we keep everyone like this. Oh, I'm keeping it real. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because what would it look like if I actually was exposed before Jesus? What is he gonna make me do? What's he gonna take away from me? Am I going to be humiliated or embarrassed? And yet we see in the scriptures that he does nothing of the sort. He didn't make a spectacle of her. He wrote in the ground. You see, Jesus didn't come just to die for you. He came to defend you. He owns you as his child. He would never put you on display. That's not his heart. And if you've been told that's what he does, you've been lied to. Read. Read about who Jesus is. You see, Jesus says in Psalms 51, 16 through 17, you don't require a sacrifice or I would offer one. You don't want a burnt offering. No. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. The moment that that woman was exposed before Jesus, the moment that she had to stand there was not the moment that she was bound or pushed down. It was the moment that she was free. He gave her a choice. I don't condemn you. As at 27 years old, I sat in my car ready to end my life and Jesus spoke to my heart and he said, where are your accusers? Haven't they condemned you? It's just me and Jesus in the car. And Jesus speaks to my heart and he says, Carrie, turn this car around and go and sin no more. That wasn't a judgment statement for me. That was freedom for me. 
I had a choice. I don't have to live the way that I've been living. I don't have to believe the lies. I don't have to walk in shame and darkness anymore. I can be free. He doesn't want my stuff. You see, this isn't a woman thing. This isn't a man thing. This is a human thing. We are desiring connection with our Father. And the moment that happens, no matter how exposed we are, we in that moment start on the journey to freedom. I watch as you men strive so hard to make a mark in the world and be significant and successful. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when it becomes your everything, when it goes away, you will have nothing. We don't need you to be more successful. We need you to be more present. Your voice is too valuable in this world. And yet everything you base it on is how much you can climb and what you can do. And it's killing you. Drop the stone. And ladies, you know I can speak to you as you struggle and strive for the perfect body and the perfect kids and the perfect marriage and the perfect Pinterest party. <laughs> it's exhausting. Your husbands are exhausted watching you. That's why they go to work so much. They don't want to do any more puff balls. <laughs> Aren't you tired yet? Aren't you tired? You see, we look at being exposed and we base being exposed on what we've known from what the world has offered us. But when you are exposed before the Lord, you are found. That's when you are found unbound. Like how I did that? <laughs> no, but truly, that's why I wear it on a shirt. I gotta remember. There are moments that I forget in fact, there are moments that I will pick up stones myself and I think I deserve this. And I'm ready to stone my own self because of the lies that I have believed and I want to hide away and watch life go by. The story is not about her. He didn't put this story in there so we could read about a woman's life changed. He put this story in here for you. The story isn't about her. It's about all of us. Jesus came so you could be free. He came for two reasons. To be intimate with you. To be close to you. And for your freedom. We confuse it. We think we've got to perform. We think we've got to keep it together. And yet God's going, you are fooling no one. We're all a mess. We're all misfits. You see, I might stand up here. The stage is a little bit higher, but don't mistake it. Don't mistake it. You and I, this is equal territory. We link arms together in this thing called life. And the playing field is even. We are all equals, and there is one hero. One. And his name is Jesus Christ. He didn't just to come to die for you. Because that would be just the end of the story. No. He came to die for you, call you his own, and he defends you. The stones that you are so worried about, the exposure that you so fear, will be the very thing that will bring you freedom. I hate that the service is only an hour. It's too short for this preacher, but we on a schedule. And I wish I could share more and more because I have a thousand more things I want to tell you, but I'm going to leave you with this. You are so very loved. You hear it a lot, but I want you to hear it one more time. You are so very loved. Not what's here. What's in here? He sees it all. He knows it all. And if you trust him, even just today, freedom is going to come. I'd love to say when I turned the car around, because clearly I did, I'm here, that it was like the next day I was better. Nope. Two years, twice a week in therapy, I was that messed up. 
but every day I got a little better. Every day I started to understand my father. We got closer, and now I think I'm his favorite. <laughs> you're his favorite. Messy and all, you're his favorite. All you have to say is three words. No, my Lord, everyone's gone. And then he does the rest, exposed before the Lord, so that you can be found unbound. Can I pray for you? Dear God, we just thank you for this moment, this moment in time where we came to church to hear from you and you came. We thank you that in this moment you have created refuge for us. For many of us, God, we are coming before you right now and we feel so exposed. Even though we're sitting in our comfortable seats and in our fancy Sunday wear, God, we are exposed in our hearts and you are speaking and saying to our hearts, it's okay, child, I don't condemn you either. For many of us, we've been carrying stones for far too long, and you're saying, it's okay, child. Let go of the stone. It's weighing you down too much, and you can't bear that responsibility. For many of us, God, the striving and the trying to be strong and never show emotion and not breaking down and just keep going and plowing through and getting back up and being more than enough is exhausting so I just pray, God, that your presence would come in here today. And for those of you that do not know Jesus, it's so simple. You just say, I want you in my life. I'm a mess. I'm exposed. And I believe that you're my savior. And he will take you the rest of the way. You just say that prayer. And he comes into your life right now. And forever, the rest of your life will be changed. Because now you have a defender. You have someone that will defend you and walk with you and love you and heal you. So I pray for healing for all the hearts that are in here today. We love you, God, in Jesus' name, amen.